Hello, and welcome to the Bamboo Lab Podcast with your host, Peak Performance Coach, Brian Bosley. Are you stuck on the hamster wheel of life, spinning and spinning, but not really moving forward? Are you ready to jump off and soar? Are you finally ready to sculpt your life? If so, you've landed in the right place. This podcast is created and broadcast just for you. All of you strivers, thrivers, and survivors out there. If you'd like to learn more about Brian and the Bamboo Lab, feel free to reach out to explore your true peak level at www.bamboolab3.com. Welcome, everyone, to this week's episode of the Bamboo Lab podcast. As always, I'm your guest, or I'm your host, Brian Bosley, and uh, we have an amazing guest on today. I want to thank all of you for doing all that you do out there in the audience, for hitting that that like button every week reviewing, rating us, subscribing, and sharing us with three people, man. It's really helped us to grow. And what, you're, what you guys are all doing, all of the guests and all the subscribers and listeners, is you are helping the world to strive, love, and live. So I thank you from the bottom of my heart. All right, I want to read a heart letter that came in just this week. And this is regarding the episode we recently did with Dr. Frederick Luskin, the Stanford University professor, who is really an expert on forgiveness and gratitude and humility. Powerful, powerful episode. This listener said, Brian, it was, this was an early one. I got this at 6.21 a.m. Brian, I've already listened to half the first half of your new episode about forgiveness. It may be one of the most profound and practical episodes I've heard yet. Everyone needs to listen to it. So if you haven't yet, please go back and listen to the episode with Dr. Fred Luskin on forgiveness. It, I've listened to it a couple of times, and it just it's really helped me a lot. I've been following Dr. Luskin for a few years now. I've got his book. I've been going through it. This is life-changing stuff, so... We're now on to this episode. Today, we have an amazing guest. And it's interesting about this guest is I've had so many other people tell me, you got to get Brian Mora on the phone. You got to get him on, on your podcast. And, and Brian and I have been social media friends. We've crossed paths more virtually than physically. Our, our careers kind of are in alignment. Uh, our belief systems are in alignment. Our thoughts are in alignment. And so it was like, that's an easy one. Let's get Brian on. So it was a pleasure to reach out to him. So today, everyone, we have Brian Mora on the phone. And just like a lot of my, few, several of my other advisors and myself, my home mothership, Brian is with Ameriprise Financial, an amazing financial planning company, very large, very, very, very uh, client service oriented, just an amazing firm. Brian started with the firm in 2001 in Voorhees, New Jersey. He was the number one first-year advisor in the entire state in 2001, and he won the Mercury Award. And I remember that award. That's been around for a long time. I didn't even come close to winning that award, but uh, it was always a prestigious first-year award. But then in 2004, Brian made a very difficult choice. He decided he was going to step away from his private practice and helping clients and move full-time into leadership. Brian became the branch manager of the Fort Lauderdale, Florida branch and successfully grew that branch from 12 financial advisors to more than 50 from 2004 to 2009. And in 2009, he re- relocated back to the Northeast to become the complex, complex director, director of the Philadelphia re- region, covering eastern PA, southern New Jersey, and Delaware. Then at the end of 2010, he moved back to Florida to become the senior franchise field vice president for the state of Florida. From 2010 to 20, he helped grow the Florida territory from $87 million in GDC, which is a measure, measure of production for those who don't know, to $135 million GDC. And he ranked in the top three in recruiting new advisors to the firm in, in all of these years, 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, 18, and 19. And in t- December of 20. 2020, Brian became the regional vice president for Ameriprise's central region, overseeing the states of Illinois, Missouri, Nebraska, Kansas, Colorado, and Utah. He has one of the strongest advisor satisfaction results in the entire company. He has this, this is, and you will know that notice this today when you, when you hear from me, he has a tremendous passion for engaging with advisors one-on-one, as well as in small group settings, he truly to truly understand their personal and professional objectives and how he can connect resources and provide advice to help advisors achieve their goals. Brian is a certified financial planner, a chartered retirement planning counselor, and an accredited wealth management advisor. He has been recognized for his outstanding leadership with the company's prestigious Outstanding Leader Award five different times, 2004, 2013, 2014, 2017, and again in 2020. 
He's a father of two young boys, Grayson and Sterling, and he is very involved in coaching their basketball and flag football. But here's another cool aspect of Brian. He's an avid athlete. He has completed dozens of marathons and triathlons headlined by the Boston Marathon itself, man. The New York City Marathon, the Miami Half Ironman, he's done that twice. The Augusta Half Ironman, he's done that twice. The Atlantic City Half Mar Ironman, the Miami Man Half Mar Ironman, and the Florida Full Ironman. What I really, really like about Brian, and this is the aspect you're going to see in him, is not only he's an amazing leader, an amazing father, an amazing athlete. He's a, an amazing, he's, a, he, he's got the most amazing heart out there. He uh, really has leveraged his athletic endeavors to raise money and help the grassroots organization, which is called the Chase Michael Anthony Kowalski Memorial Foundation. He helped it get off the ground. For those who don't know, Chase Kowalski was a young boy who loved sports. He loved baseball. He loved running and he liked triathlons. And unfortunately, in December of 2012, Chase was killed in the Sandy Hook, Connecticut school shooting. Brian has helped raise more than he's raised tens of thousands of dollars to date through his running and triathlons to honor Chase's memory. Brian is also an ambassador for the organization called Special Compass, which partners able-bodied athletes with differently abled uh, persons to help those with disabilities participate in the sports of running, cycling, and triathlon races. You know, a lot of times when I get a bio from a firm, from a, a gentleman or a lady or a guest that's coming on, I tend to cut a lot out because they're rather long. I, I couldn't cut much out of this. Everything that's on here is crucial, and it really kind of en encompasses, encapsulates the man you're going to meet here in just a moment. So without further ado, my friend, Brian Mora, welcome to the Bamboo Lab podcast. Brian, it's nice to be, uh, nice to be in the lab, and thanks for, uh, thanks for such a warm welcome. Um, gosh, I got... Um, I knew what you were going to say. I gave you that bio and uh, I found myself, uh, I found myself quite emotional at the end when you were talking about some of the, the community work and, and the families that, that I've worked with. We'll get into some of that, I'm sure. But, um, well, I, I, uh, I'm, for those who know me, I'm rarely speechless, but I, I, I needed a, I needed a second as you read that. That was, uh, that was quite something. Well, I'm glad I'm going to make you speechless. Now let's see if I can make you cry. <laughs> you were close. You were already close. We're two minutes in, and it almost happened. <laughs> what was that? Who was that sportscaster? That his uh, his his kind of his his niche was to get athletes to cry. Firestone. Oh, it was like Roy Firestone. Roy Firestone. Yeah. yeah. He, made an, he made an appearance in Jerry Maguire, right? When when Cuba Gooding Jr.'s character, you know, finally came through and had the big moment. He's like, you know, you're not going to make me cry. And then Roy Firestone announces his new contract. And he starts to cry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. That's what made me realize. I didn't even know that about him until I watched that movie. I'm like, I didn't know that was his kind of niche to, or his little stick that he got people to cry. I'm like, hey. Yeah, he, like, he would dig stuff up and, and bring, bring stuff up that nobody knew was going to be brought up and then catch up in the moment. You, you, I, I knew you were going to talk about this, but you still got Ah, good. See, we got more coming. All right. So, Brian, I've got obviously I've been able to read some of your bio and, and I've gotten to know you over the years, primarily through social media and had a couple of wonderful conversations with you recently. And uh, but I'd like you. Can you share with the Bamboo Pack audience a little bit about yourself, your childhood, where you're from, your family, what in, what or who inspired you? You share whatever you want. Yeah, I'm happy to. So, you know, it's interesting. I've listened to um, several of your uh your Bamboo Lab podcast, and I think those of us in the audience that get to listen to these are really fortunate for, for the work you do and uh, the guests that you bring on, and uh, you know, I'm just mind-blown. I'm First of all, I'm humbled to be in the company of the other guests that have come before me and sort of mind-blown at, at the, you know, in some cases, the successes of your guests, the um, the stories of resiliency of, of your guests, the, the, the backgrounds that some have, have overcome, uh, the paths that they've charted. You know, I, I, I would say that, um, you know, for those that don't know me, my my story, and I'll kind of give a you know, quick quick insight in terms of where I grew up and my family dynamics and things like that. I would say, especially as an adult, my focus has been on um, not wasting the gift. And, and I define the gift as um, what I've been given and been privileged to be given in life because of a really good upbringing. So... Um, my my life starts in southern New Jersey. So my my mom and dad, Ben and Kathy, um, they they grew up in Atlantic City, New Jersey, kind of like 
Formats Las Vegas. <laughs> um, they're high school sweethearts. They've been married for over 50 years. I have an older brother who's six years older than me. I'm 44. My brother will be, uh, be 50 in a couple of days. And uh, we grew up on the beach in New Jersey. So uh, one town south of Atlantic City is a small little beach community called Bentner. Uh, my parents raised us there. And uh, and we had a great life. Uh, my, my mom and dad um, are both retired, but they, they both worked uh, as the state state employees, state workers. My dad in the education system, my mom in the uh, in the court system. And so we grew up um, middle class. And I would tell you, Brian, I thought I grew up rich. You know, if I needed a pair of basketball sneakers to play basketball, I, I, we had them. Uh, we went on family vacations. Um, I, I, I don't think I was spoiled, per se. Um, but I grew up with the things that I needed to have a really, really, really help, help, happy and, and healthy life. I was uh, had the opportunity to be put in sports. I learned to play the piano. Uh, my parents encouraged education. Uh, you know, like every family, right? We're not perfect, and, and they're not perfect. And my life in childhood wasn't perfect. But you know, when I think about um, some of your guests or some of the stories we hear, where people talk about you know really challenging early starts in life. Um, my mom and dad had those, and we might get into that a bit. My mom and dad had a really challenging um, upbringing in terms of socioeconomic and, and c- certain other things. Um, I grew up not with privilege, but certainly with um, with a head start, with a great investment, with two encouraging parents, and, and with a lot of opportunity. And I think for most of my life, I've been focused on how do I take advantage of that? How do I not waste that gift? And not only make something of my life and make a great life for my kids, but how do I... Um, make a great life and make a great impact in the world. Like I take that responsibility. It can seem, you know, insincere or you know, a little hollow, but I, I, I mean it sincerely. How do I actually make an impact through my actions, through my influence, um, to have a greater impact, um, have a greater impact on the world? And so, uh, so just the rest of my background, really quick. Um, I, I, like I said, I grew up at the, at the beach in New Jersey. Um, I have sand in my shoes, as a saying, which is, I, even though I live in Florida now and I've lived in Florida for almost 20 years, um, I, you know, I just love the ocean. I love the beach. I love the sun. I've always sort of been connected to the shore. Um, I went to a small state school in northern New Jersey for college uh, outside of New York City. It's it's called Montclair State University. I um, earned a you know four-year degree there. And as you were mentioning my professional background, you mentioned Ameriprise. Um, I've quite literally been with Ameriprise for my entire professional career. So I'm 44. I started here when I'm 22. Um, I've been at the same company for for 22 years. All the different seats and things you read in my bio, obviously, I've progressed through the firm and had a lot of blessings here, too. Had a lot of great leaders who poured into me and developed me and invested in me. Um, but, uh, you know, I've bounced back and forth a couple of times between New Jersey and Florida, but I've essentially been in Florida for the last 20 years. Uh, personally, last thing, right, I've got uh, two two little boys that you mentioned. Uh, they're nine and six and, uh, and, you know, they're just, they're just fantastic. They're, they're good students. They're good boys. They're mama's boys. <laughs> um, uh, but they, they do great in school. Uh, they they play sports and, and most importantly, uh, they're shaping to be really good people. And I think that's the top responsibility we have as a parent. Sometimes parents get caught up in, you know, what trophy their kid won or what grade their kid got at the end of the day. I want my kids to be good human beings. And that's really what I'm focused on most importantly. Well, you know, with you, you know, everybody, when I've talked to people about you and I, and I had, when I, when I marketed this podcast a week and a half or two weeks ago, after you and I had decided on a date and talked and did our pre kind of conversation, I posted on Facebook, you know, coming soon, you know, look, look out, stay tuned for Brian Moore on the Bamboo Lab podcast. And, you know, there was so much, so many people reaching out and direct messaging me. I remember one particular person who you and I both know said to me, is this the Brian Mora? And I thought that was something I'm like, yeah, it's the one and only man. I got the dude on. So, you know, you have this, obviously this reputation you do. And, and everywhere I go, and I've even asked, you know, I have a lot of clients still with Ameriprise Financial in different parts, whether it's the uh, the franchise or the employee side, a lot of leaders and not really advisors, most people in leadership roles. And I've, I've asked them in the last couple of weeks, you know, hey, have you ever run into Brian Mora? And, you know, those who said, oh, yeah, yeah, I know him. I've run into him. Or some people said, no, I've never met him, but I know of him. And, Every single person to the person, everything, everybody said, he's an amazing person. I've heard nothing but good things about him. High integrity, great leader, great communicator. So the question for you, Brian, is to get to that point in life, who or what really, something came up from an amazing family, my mom and dad, high school sweethearts, you know, married for many, many years, decades. 
who or what really inspired you? Was there a person, a moment, a book or a movie or something that kind of really you can go back and say that was kind of a turning point for me? You know, I would, I would tell you that it really is my parents who were, were my earliest inspiration um, and, and still are to a certain extent. Um, you know, you, you, as, as you grow and you get older in life, you do draw inspiration from, you know, whether it's leaders you meet, books you read, things that you see as the world gets bigger, right? Maybe the world gets smaller and you get bigger within it. I'm not sure which is which, but, um, it, you know, I'll, I'll just unpack a little bit about, you know, my parents for a minute and why I draw inspiration from them. While I don't have kind of a rags to riches story to tell in terms of my own life, my, my parents sort of do. And, and, you know, my dad is, um, one of four. Um, he's actually the baby of the family. So I, I had, um, uh, uh, an aunt growing up who's since passed away and two uncles, one of whom is still with us. And, um, my, my dad grew up really, really, really poor. Um, his father passed away when he was really young. And so the four of them were essentially raised by my grandmother on my, my dad's side. And, um, the, I think it's probably safe and fair to say that the, the only reason he got an opportunity to go to college was because some people in the community in Atlantic city saw some athletic talent in him and helped him get involved in sports and to take him to practice and make sure he could play sports. And my dad ultimately got a football scholarship to go play at the University of Bridgeport in Connecticut. And that's how he was able to earn a college education to ultimately come out and, and get his first job um, teaching. He eventually went back and, and got his uh, master's degree. And through his career, uh, he worked his way into administration in a school system all the way up to and including uh, some roles as, as acting and interim superintendent of a, of a pretty large school district in New Jersey. And so while on one hand, that climb and that journey inspires me, one of the other things that really inspires me is, you know, I know we're doing this on the phone, so people can't necessarily see, but from a racial perspective, I'm, I'm white Caucasian. My parents are both white. And my dad chose to work his uh, entire 40 plus year career um, in, a, in a really um, underprivileged, both socioeconomic, but also a, um, a, a district that I would say lacked racial diversity. It was mostly black, some Hispanic, and very low socioeconomic, where you had a lot of different impacts in the community, a lot of single family homes, men and women single family homes. And I always found it interesting that he chose to, while he was growing his professional career and maybe stepping through different roles, promoted, so to speak, he, he opted to work in a school district um, for over 40 years where things were the most challenging. And when you really think about the whole educational system, that's like one of the most noble professions in the country, right? You think about police, firefighter, teachers, people who don't make, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of dollars, but are providing such an incredible need and service in our community. And it wasn't just the decision to be in education and stay in education. It was also to never leave a community where he was really needed. And so I think that, um, you know, and I'll talk about my mom in a minute, but I think that that was one really significant foundational sort of um, representation for me of what it means to, yes, you can further yourself. There's no no shame in earning a living and saving money and making money and retiring one day and taking care of your family. But what does it really mean to recognize where there's a need that you can help and see that all the way through? Not for a day, not for a week, not for a quarter, for four, for four years, literally for four years. And so that's that's one side of my inspiration. The other is is my mom's side of that. So uh, my mom um, grew up one, one of two. She had, had an older brother who since passed away. That was my uncle Bob. She too was raised in Atlantic City. And I, I would say my grandfather, um, uh, so her dad, um, and I'm making one general statement about him. This doesn't define him as a person, but I would say that in general, he, he did a lot of favoritism of of my uncle. Um, sort of uh, the, the generation or the time period, the error, so to speak, of boys are going to do grow up to do this and women will maybe grow up to do that. Like one story that stands out in my mind was where my uncle's typewriter broke and my mom had to give his typewriter or her typewriter to him because, of course, the boy was more important in the family and maybe they didn't have the money for a second typewriter. So she had to give hers up so that my uncle could have right more investment in him. Um, things like, Oh, geez, I don't know. My mom asked questions one time of my grandfather about like the process of getting a new car. Instead of saying, well, you'd have to work really hard and save your money and here's the process. It was like, well, you're never going to own 
own your own car or buy a new car. There was just a sort of a pouring into her that she wouldn't amount to much or do much to be able to do the same things that um, maybe a, a boy or a man man could do. And, um, you know, my mom didn't uh, operate as a stay-at-home mom. You know, she had my brother and I. She went to college part-time for many years. And I was at my mom's college graduation. And then she became a working professional and, and built her own career and her own retirement, her own pension, and all of her own stuff. And so, you know, I've heard other women on your podcast. And, and you had a guest recently who's a close friend of mine and I've worked with a long time, uh, Sabrina Tashini. I heard Sabrina talk all about her, you know, mission for empowering women and supporting women and things like that. And, you know, that obviously matters a lot to her as a woman and with her daughter. Um, that matters a lot to me, too, even though I'm not a woman, obviously, seeing my mom not take those things uh, and take them to heart and let them hold her back in life and say, you know, I'm, I'm going to chart my own path and overcome my own path or uh, overcome those things. Um, those are, you know, those are two inspirations for me, for sure. Well, when you were talking, Brian, you know, you brought up four or three people, your mom, dad, and Sabrina, and I'm also you as my guest today. What I, what I see is, um, or what I, what I kind of uh, hear screaming out that really separates people like the four of you so far mentioned versus a lot of people is really having a meaningful mission in life. I don't know if you, there's a, there's a book out right now called The Greatness Mindset by Lewis Howes. And uh, this guy's incredible. Um, he's got a podcast out. I think it's called the Greatness. It's something greatness, something uh, podcast or something. But um, he was on, he was on uh, the Ed Milet show recently. And I listened to it. And of course, I've, I've known of Lewis Howes for a while. And he talks extensively about having that meaningful mission in life. And I know you have it. I know Sabrina has it, and it clearly your mom and dad had that too. And I, I think in, when you and I were talking a few weeks ago, that I wasn't thinking of that, but when I was reading uh, uh, Mr. Howe's book here recently, it made me think of our conversation a few weeks ago or a couple of weeks ago. Um, Absolutely. Now, Brian, uh, any books that really stand out for you? Because I know a lot of my audience really likes to read and they like to hear any book suggestions, anything you have out there that somebody can say, hey, I want to check that out. Yeah, so um, th I mean, this is a really popular one right now, but I, I think that um, that there's a couple of you know just powerful, powerful learnings in it, uh, and I, I would have to imagine. I unfortunately haven't listened to every one of your podcasts. I have to imagine if you ask all of your guests this, the book will have come up before, and then I'll try to sprinkle in one or two that maybe isn't as uh, as well known. But for me, uh, Atomic Habits mm -hmm. um, right now is is just incredible. Like I, I, I love. Uh, I won't spoil the book by sharing just kind of one of the elements in there, but. One of the elements that I think about all the time is, is you know, what is your self-talk and your mindset around a habit? For example, like in the book, and I'm sure you've read it, Brian, the book, it gives the example of if you were to ask somebody who's a non-smoker if they'd like a cigarette, they would say, uh, no, thank you, I don't smoke, or no, thank you, I'm not a smoker. If you were to ask somebody who is a smoker, but perhaps is recently committed to quitting if they'd like a cigarette. They wouldn't say the same thing. They wouldn't say, in all likelihood, they wouldn't say, no, thanks, I'm not a smoker. They would say, no, thanks, I'm trying to quit. Mm -hmm. And so I think about that connected to other things that I don't have licked in life, right? Like I'm not a smoker, so that one's not an issue for me. But there's lots of other things I'm trying to do or I'm attempting to do or I'd like to do. And if you ask me about them, is my mindset, oh, Brian, I am this or I am doing this or I will do this or is it? I'm trying to do that. I, I would like to do that. And, and so much of that is like the mental game of life. And so, you know, obviously that book has great implications for, for business, but you know, there's, I mean, it's, it's silly, right? Like I, I coach kids sports and I don't yell at the kids, but I tend to be a yeller when I'm coaching and I'd like to dial that back a little bit. So you know, do I say uh, for next season, I, I am going to coach this way or I will coach this way, or I'm trying to dial back how much I yell, right? Like which, which one is it and how committed um, am I to it? Um, one other one that I, I absolutely love, this one might be a little bit less well-known. Um, there's a book called uh, Relentless by uh, by Tim Grover. Uh, Brian, you ever, ever read that book? Oh, ever yeah. Hear that? I've read that and the other one, which is uh, his other one. Um, uh, oh, he's got two of them out that I, I've read them both. Yeah, I loved them both. I, I yes. love his style. 
So, so, so what I particularly love about Relentless, and for your audience who may not know who, who Tim Grover is, so he, he really came to fame um, in the in the early '90s. Um, Michael Jordan hired him as his personal trainer. For those that aren't sports fans, you know, Michael Jordan started playing in the NBA. Everybody knows who Michael Jordan is, but he started playing in the NBA in the '80s. And for the first many seasons of his career, he got really kind of beat up physically by the other teams, and he didn't do any winning. And he was frustrated with the Chicago Bulls coaching staff that they weren't really training him hard enough and helping him get physically strong and tough enough to overcome, you know, sort of the physicality of the game of basketball. And so he, he somehow got linked up with Tim. I forget the details on how they met or came to know each other. But Mike ended up hiring, Michael and Jordan ended up hiring Tim. And, you know, the rest is history. He becomes the greatest, you know, uh, basketball player, arguably, potentially ever, you know, six championships, et cetera. And he went on to, um, Grover did go on to coach other NBA greats like Kobe Bryant and Dwayne Wade. And, and in his book, he really defines, it's not so much defines winners for losers, because he actually compares people like Jordan and Kobe and Wade to other really successful, accomplished players like LeBron James. But he says there's certain attributes and characteristics that some of these winners have. And, you know, the biggest takeaway for me in that book is like the next mentality. So that's that connects more to me, like not wasting the gift. You know, yeah, I'm proud of some of the things I've accomplished, but how do I, you know, uh, uh, achieve something, feel good about that, but then set a new goal somewhat quickly? How do I not, you know, end up on this podcast reading you um, successes from 20 years ago? I'd like to talk about something that happened recently and continue to challenge myself to be relevant and keep evolving and keep setting a new goal. Um, we've all we've all been around that person that's telling stories from 20 or 30 years ago and i don't doubt their success but it's kind of an eye roll like have you done anything lately (laughs) well it it goes back to you know some people don't really have 30 years of experience they have one year of experience they've just repeated it 30 times and they they go back to that first year they keep talking about it because it was a one hell of a good year but and maybe, and maybe the last one I give the audience that's really cool to check out, um, you know, David Go- David Goggins, who's, who most people know, you know, uh, a Navy SEAL ultra marathoner, uh, motivational speaker. He's got two books out. His his second book just dropped in uh, like November of last year. So maybe it's been on the market for six months. If anybody is interested or knows who, who he is and is interested, I won't talk about what he talks about in the book. I'll just say that from a format perspective, if you're going to check out either one of his, his first book was called Can't Hurt Me, and his second was called Never Finished. If you check those out, I recommend actually listening to them through Audible versus reading them. And the reason why is because the Audible version of those books, he's doing what you and I do. He has his co-author read a couple of chapters, and then they hit the pause button on the reading, and the two of them have a dialogue like a podcast, and they kind of unpack what was just read in the book. So you get so much more from him, more stories, more, you know, what so what of what you just read. And it's a it's a much deeper experience than just and I know some people old school that like to hold the book and read it. Um, the podcast version of those two books is really cool. I think Gladwell does some of that stuff, too, where he podcasts his book and stuff like that. Yeah, my son is a my son, Dawson. Brian is a big fan of Goggins. In fact, for Christmas, I got him never finished. Um, and our mutual friend, Dave Dick, was the person who introduced me to Goggins a few years ago. He, they, then when the book came out, when You Can't Hurt Me uh, came out on Audible, he sent me a copy, an Audible copy of it. And uh, it, it, I mean, the guy is just uh, he's a breed above what I've ever seen in my life. I mean, he is I, his stories he tells about his running and training and the pain he's gone through. And he says, you know what? I will probably be end up in a wheelchair in the future. But then somebody interviewing him said, then what will you do then? He goes, I'll change the world through a wheelchair. I'll keep doing something and I'll just be, I'll work my ass off doing it. And I'll be the best there is at it. You know, I just, that, that mental toughness, very much like Tim Grover. I mean, I, I love Tim Grover's style. I love the story. That, and I don't know if it was Relentless or oh, I, his second book or his other book. I can't remember what it is. Winning. It's called Winning. Tim Grover's other book is Winning. And in one of the books, he tells a story about him. <laughs> I love this. You know, these bat- NBA players now after after you know, Michael Jordan, probably Kobe Bryant. They're like, we got to hire this guy. And they, so they, you know, they basically he would interview them and say, okay. And they, he, if he if he passed and said, yeah, or he said, yes, I'll work with you. I'll coach you. He would always say, "Meet me at the at the um, at, on the courts at three o'clock tomorrow." He wouldn't he wouldn't specify a.m. or p.m. Well, Grover would be there at, at three three a.m. Of course, the player was never there at three a.m. And he'd come back again at three p.m. and say, "Well, where were you?" And the player would say, "What do you mean? I'm here. It's three p.m." He goes, "I didn't specify a.m. or p.m." So it was I meant a.m. 
It was like the first lesson these guys would learn. Like, well, and so that's what he would do. He would start at like three o'clock in the morning, you know, just to practice and, 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 and increase their mental toughness. Yeah, just to even even test their willingness, right? Right. Do you know? Uh, do you, Do you know who uh, Elliot Kipchoge is? Do you know? Does that name mean anything to you? No. So Elliot Kipchoge, uh, bear with me. I'll take you on a tangent here, really quick. It's, it's really interesting. So Elliot Kipchoge um, is the world record holder for uh, the fastest marathon time. He also, uh, about four years ago, set out with Nike on a project called the 159 Project. No human had ever run a marathon in under two hours. And he set the goal of trying to be able to do it. He ultimately did it. And that is not considered the world record time because it wasn't during like an official marathon race. They sort of did like a closed course in Vienna. They found a stretch of road. They had a team of runners. They scouted a place. They Nike and made this huge investment. They did a massive preparation. In fact, there's a, a great documentary. Uh, it's probably on most of the streaming platforms, Apple, et cetera, called the Kipchoge movie. And they document the whole journey on the 159 project. And look, Brian, Elliot Kipchoge running a two hour marathon or now he's done, done it sub two hours, like 159, 46 or something. He beat the two hour mark by like 15 or 20 seconds. There's no question that he has more natural God given endurance talent than you or me. No question, right? Like to do that, he has some natural God-given gifts. And he's also applied himself in training, right? I'm, I'm a long-distance endurance athlete. He's trained longer and harder than I have. I'll give him that too. But in the Kipchoge movie, of all the different specialists he has, right? He's got a nutrition person, a hydration person, somebody that like charted the course and Nike's working on a special shoe for him. He's got all these specialists. But one of the specialists that I thought was most fascinating is he has a mind coach, a mind coach. Just pause on that for a second and just think about to be at the top level of anything. He's making an investment. Like I, I think I'm pretty successful in business. I don't I don't have a mind coach. <laughs> you know, like he's got a mind coach, and that mind coach who does this for a living said he's the mentally toughest person I've ever met. So I, I just reflect on that one moment in the movie and I'm like, you know, yeah, talent's important and practice is important and skill development is important, but to achieve something great. You, you know, you've referenced Goggins' as mental toughness. You, you just have to be able to be mentally tougher than other people in whatever it is that you're attempting to do. You know, whether it's a, a climb, a, you know, a, a ladder climb at work, a community endeavor, whatever it is, there's something real to mental toughness. Kind of mention it and then move past it, but it's a real thing. Is, it, is the movie called Kutobi The Last Milestone? I'm just, you know, I don't know. I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, if, 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 when, when you, you know, when you put this out, I'll, I'll have to look up exact. I thought it was, I thought it was literally called the Kipchoge movie, but I, I could be wrong on the specific titling. It, it, it dropped, uh, it dropped like two, maybe two years ago, three years ago. Um, it's about an hour and a half documentary that I think was streaming on on Apple, but it's probably on all the streaming services. It's probably on Netflix and stuff like that now. The reason I'm asking, I've never heard of this, but I'm, I'm just was googling it as you were talking, and I'm. I want to include the link to it on the podcast, on the show. Yeah, what, no, what, no, what, what, maybe the last point on him, what's kind of interesting, right? He just had his own moment of humility this week. So Monday was the Boston Marathon, and he finished sixth at the Boston Marathon. I don't know the last time he's entered a race that he hasn't won. Like He is the gold, like multi-time gold medal winner in the Olympics in the marathon. He's a Kenyan, um, you know, Kenyan runner. Um, but, I mean, like he's, I don't know, 10, 20, 30 marathons in a row. If he entered, he won, and he finished sixth in his tweet was like, you know, it wasn't like he didn't call himself the greatest, but he's like, you know, even the best have a bad day and I didn't feel quite right today and and I didn't I didn't perform, right? And so, you know, there's some power in that too, the humility of just saying today wasn't my day and even the, the top of every profession has their has their off day. <laughs> oh my gosh, for sure. Um do you remember a guy by the name of is it Sebastian Cole? I don't know that name, no. I see I was when I was in like seventh and eighth grade, Brian, I was all into long distance running. I mean, long distance back then was five to 10 miles. I think the longest race I ran was about nine miles. Um, but it was my life. You know, I had runners, uh, running, runners died or, uh, running magazine. Was it runners digest or runners, uh, runners, uh, yeah. runners, runners, world, I runners think. world. Yeah. I had those subscriptions. I read everything. And he, I think it was Sebastian Cole was the, was the marathoner at that time who was winning all the races and he became kind of my hero. Now my body frame didn't allow me to, I was, much leaner than uh, real skinny. I was b real skinny in my body. You know, when I got into high school, I started filling out. So I really wasn't, I kind of lost interest in running, even though I did run track for a couple of years. I moved in more into football. Um, but um, yeah, he was, he was, he was my hero. I'm pretty sure that's who it was. 
uh, was I think it was Sebastian Coe. I, I, and something came up on him recently on, on social media. I saw it. I'm like, hey, that's that same guy I used to idolize. So anyway. That's, that's great. So, Brian, another question for you. Over the last couple of years, and I, you can pick the time frame, one, two, three years. We've had, you know, obviously, our country has gone through some changes. The world has gone through some changes. Um, not just political, but economical, culturally. What have you seen as your greatest learning during this kind of ha- crazy, chaotic time frame? Um, I think there's a couple of things that are really interesting over the last few years. Um, one is uh, how quickly uh, society can change or be impacted by something um, and, and, and how important the human interaction is. Um, you know, if you work in a, a business or corporate world that uh, for, I mean, there were certain industries and businesses that didn't have the luxury of shutting down when COVID first struck, right? You know, if you're in a hospital or police or fire, you can't just say we're closing the hospital because of COVID. In fact, that became sort of ground zero for dealing with COVID. But, you know, if you work in a professional business environment, I can tell you our, our firm went virtual, so to speak, for, for several weeks and months. And then there became this um, phrase across, uh, whether across the world or across America, called return to office. and um, I really have, have tried to stay away from that phrase in terms of that the mission isn't to get people back to an office for a nine to five, because one of the blessings of, of COVID, if there even is such a thing to be blessed with COVID, I don't know that's the right way to say it, but maybe one of the positive learnings is that, you know, we learned to operate the business without having to sit within the four walls of a brick and mortar, right? Between, you know, Zoom type of technology and other things, you know, we, we learn to adapt. So there's a positive that, you know, humans can be pretty agile and adapt pretty quickly to crisis. But the phrase I've used is return to people because, you know, just because you come into an office doesn't mean that you'll interact. But one of the things that we really lost that I think led to a whole variety of bad things, right? Like just un- undetected and undiagnosed, you know, loneliness and, and mental health issues. And, you know, some people used COVID to get in great shape. Other people sort of went you know, in, uh, inside and never came out and their diet changed or their workouts changed and, you know, things like that. I just saw yesterday, I saw a guy um, that I hadn't seen in, a, in, in about a year. Now I've seen him since COVID, but in the last year, he's lost a lot of weight. I said, Hey man, you look great. He goes, yeah, I dropped the COVID. I dropped the COVID 45 and we laughed and he goes, no, that was a real thing though. Right. He's like, I, I gained like 50 pounds during COVID. And, uh, and now I'm committed in, in getting it off, right? Some people got really in shape. Some people, you know, not being around people, it, it really impacted them. Um, so I, I just think that the, the COVID learning, you know, was how important the human connection is. That human connection doesn't have to be nine to five in a workplace five days a week, like maybe the traditional job was pre-COVID. But, you know, if, if, if somebody just hangs out alone in their basement from now until eternity, there's, there's a reason why, you know, you don't let people stay in solitary confinement, even in prison for, for 50 years, right? Like that, that leads to some really significant mental health issues. And so on the positive side, I've, I've learned over the last year or two that as human beings, we can really adapt to crisis and, and become more flexible than maybe we thought. And I think that some people have underestimated how important uh, the human connection is. I, I would also just say that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not very political and I'm not into political statements, but I think the other learning, it's not just in the last year, it's like the last three to five years. It's really sort of, I don't know if it's a learning or just a disappointment as to sort of how, how divisive the, the country is, you know? And like at some point we've got to, I don't, I don't know how it happens or who it happens with or through, but like there needs to come back to, you know, like Brian, you and I have talked a lot. We've interacted a lot. I don't know your political views, but I can tell you that you're the type of person and I'm the type of person we can have completely different views but we're still going to be friends and get on here and rap and be cool and, and, and have a good time together. That's just not the case for a lot of people in the country. A lot of people say your views are different than mine. So therefore we're enemies and I hate. It's like, wait a minute, we're all on the same team. here, And, and so that, that's just been a, you know, kind of a disappointment and, and, and a learning. And I don't quite know what to do about it, but it's, it weighs on me a lot as somebody that has kids that are little and are going to live in this country for, you know, they might, they might be alive for a hundred more years. Right. You know? Well, you know, and that's when we had Dr. Luskin on last week, Brian, or actually it was, it was a couple of, two or three weeks ago, but it aired, it actually aired this week. Um, he talked a little bit about, we didn't go into politics, which I never do on the podcast. Obviously we, we kind of 
do what we what you just said. It's kind of where we go. Uh, just to, and a lot of people have shared that. That is one of the learnings they've gotten over the past few years is how divisive we are. And I asked Dr. Luskin because his specialty is forgiveness, you know, and he heads the forgiveness project at Stanford University. He started, I think, when he was still a grad student, I believe, or maybe he was getting his doctorate. Um, and he said, I said, you know, I've always told my friends and family during a political upheaval when I said, don't worry, every the pendulum always swings back to the middle. And so it always does. You know, you get extreme views on one side that are louder than the other. And you, everybody thinks the world is the, the sky is falling. But pretty soon it begins to settle in the middle. And I asked Dr. Luskin, will that happen? Can that happen? He goes, oh, of course it can happen. He said, um, but he said, we have to start with forgiveness. And he gave a stat. And I believe it was 50 some percent of once one uh, political party would never date the, somebody from the other political party. And the other one was 30 some percent of the other political party would never date the other political party. And it was just alarming. And he said it comes down to that we put we view people from a perspective that is not real. You know, we're teaching our children. We are teaching our children to go against the natural grains of mental health. And we're not doing our, our next generation any favors by having this divisiveness and teaching them that if somebody is Republican and you're a Democrat, don't have anything to do with them, they're wrong. Or if you're Republican, you don't listen to anybody who's Democrat because they're wrong. I mean, it's just, he said, it, it, it can happen. He said, and, and people tend to actually come to their senses after a while and, um, and, uh, you know, they start seeing the wrongs in their, in their viewpoints, but it has, to, it has to begin with forgiveness. And he said, and forgiveness starts with two things, humility and gratitude. You know, and that's, he said, that's where the problem is today. You see on social media, these people praising themselves and all these selfies and things. He said, that's not humility. That's, that's pride. That's ego. That's insecurity. And he says, it's that kind of thing that's driving a lot of this. He said, we have to go back to really being humble about who we are, realizing a lot of amazing things happen every day in this world that we have nothing to do with. We don't contribute one ounce to. He said, that's the beginning of humility. And then gratitude, being grateful for all that's around you. And um, he said, it can get back. And from my perspective, Dr. Luskin believes it will come back to a, um, to a more balanced nature in our, in our society. Well, hopefully, but I agree with you. Now, Brian, you said something. You said it was uh, the phrase was kind of return to office, but you had a phrase. Was it return to peak? People. People. Okay. You know, your your viewpoint was so in, uh, some similar to Bill Williams when I had him on the podcast in the summer of 2022. And he talked a lot about the human interaction, the connection and how valuable that is. And I couldn't agree more. And I sometimes wonder, Brian, what is your thoughts? What are your thoughts on this? Social media, texting, email. I mean, it broadens our ability to connect with people we never would have connected with. You know, you're an example. You and I, are, our friendship is an example. We probably would have heard of each other, but without social media and staying in touch and then being able to text back and forth and email, we wouldn't have built the friendship. You wouldn't be on the podcast. I probably wouldn't have a podcast. So we, we can broaden and meet these amazing human beings that we may not have connected with, but at the same time, we may not get as close to the people who are closest to us because we're too busy on, we're too busy texting or we're not having those deep interactions so often. Do you think from your perspective, is technology an impetus to human connection or has it been a hindrance to human connection? I think the answer is actually both. I don't think it's black and white one or the other because I, I think you're absolutely correct. It, it either A, keeps people who... I mean, think about it. I grew up in New Jersey. So, you know, my childhood friends, my my high school friends, my college friends, th a lot of them didn't matriculate out of New Jersey. So I still have a huge contingent of people that I know in New Jersey, but I've lived in Florida for almost 20 years. And professionally, I've managed businesses all over the country. So I have, and you know, the, the lines get not, not crossed, but get mixed together between you work with people long enough, you build acquaintances and friendships and you keep in touch. So social media is a great way to still see what's happening in their life and know what's going on and sometimes be prompted or connected to, you know, I don't know. I, I see that it's your birthday. Maybe we haven't talked in a year, but I at least reach out to you on your birthday and we talk on the phone and wish you happy birthday or whatever it is. But it, it also can happen where you realize, oh, wow, I've, I, I've texted with my parents a lot the past month, but I actually, I actually haven't picked up the phone and, and called my mom to talk to her. I haven't FaceTimed with them and looked at them on camera. My, my folks still live in Jersey, so it's not as simple as driving down the street to see them. They visit us often. We visit them often. But, you know, you can you can have the really most important relationships 
um, where you're absolutely right. Weeks or months can go by and you think you've connected because you like their picture on Facebook and you sent them a text, but you haven't actually talked to them. You haven't gotten that, that component. And uh, in a business sense, I can just tell you, like, <laughs> I was at an executive leadership summit last week with, uh, with about 150 leaders of Ameriprise. And somebody made the joke at the end of the three days. It was just a powerful three days, right? We worked on the business, we connected, we networked. It was just a great couple of days. And somebody made the joke at the end and said, hey, how do you think this meeting would have went if we were on Microsoft Teams for the last, you know, uh, 36 or 48 hours? And it was like a laugh in the room because everybody knows that, you know, the, the dinner, the networking reception, the meetings, the coffee breaks, and all the things that happen, um, th- there's no way the power of that could have happened. In, in a virtual setting over Zoom or Teams or Skype or whatever, right? So I think the answer is both. I think social media is wonderful. I'm on, you know, I've kind of, I'm on Twitter to just kind of follow the news. I'm, I'm a pretty active Facebook user. But the, the last thing that I think we all know is true, and I think there's more science coming of that, is that what you see on social media isn't always the truth, right? So, you know, um, I'm not one to go on there and blab about my problems. We all have problems. But I'm not, you know, if I have a particularly, you know, tough day, an argument with my family or, you know, a frustration at work, there's some people that go on there and put their whole life on there. But I tend to share more, you know, I'm not trying to present myself as perfect, but I tend to share more of things that make me happy or more of the things I want the world to know. Hey, my kids did great in sports or I just came from a great business meeting. So to really know me, um, you're not fully knowing me if all you know me through is social media, because what I present out there to the world is is not the full truth right i have bad days i have worries i have concerns i have fears i have disappointments i don't share most of those on social media <laughs> i i agreed i think from the social media perspective or even any technology we can get to know a person on two dimensions you know but to get that third dimensional connection there has to be interaction there has to be i want to hear your voice or I want to see your face, or I want to watch your expressions, and I want to put my arm around you, give you a hug, want to you know shake your hand, I want to sit next to you at dinner. And you know, an example we talked about a mutual friend of ours, Fred Schultz, um, to, from the, the financial advisor, speaker, coach, and author of an amazing book called Keep Showing Up. He was on the podcast several months ago. You know, Fred and I got to know each other on social media. No idea why, probably because we have so many Ameriprise connections and. You know, we just followed each other for several years. And a few years ago, we I reached out to him or he reached out to me. I'm not sure. And we started texting. And then it was like, hey, let's talk on the phone. And I was telling you in the pre-show today, Brian, that he and I talk uh, every six to eight weeks now on the phone. And we just have this amazing conversation. It's about his life, my life, family, and uh, what we're going through. And at the end of every conversation, it's always, I love you, brother. And I love you, too. Or a text um Dave Dick is a mutual friend of ours, and uh, I consider Dave my top five best friends. I've only met Dave one time. It was 18 years ago when I was doing some training out in Vancouver or Portland, or I'm not sure which office, and he was a newer manager at the time, and they had him come to the office or to the airport to pick me up, and he brought his wife and three daughters, and then we, we all went to lunch before we went to the office, before he and I went back to the office. And uh, we talk all the time. We'll talk for two or three hours on the phone. You know, or text every morning, hey, I want you to know you're loved and appreciated, and I want you to have a great day. Just know that I'm thinking of you today. And just, you know, and it's it's the conversation on the phone. And I can't wait until we actually see each other for the second time in our in our 18 years of friendship, which I'm hoping I can get out to Texas uh, this sometime this year and spend some time with him and his family. But you know, it's it, I'm with you. It's not it's not one or the other. It's both. It has a there is a hindrance to it, but there's also a great beauty to it if it's used properly. But I'll tell you something about our buddy. First of all, I love Dave Dick and shout out to Dave if he's listening. I'll tell you something about our buddy coach Fred, Fred Schultz, is that um he he one of his catchphrases is keep showing up. And and he shows up. He, I mean, he actually shows up. So when you talk about connection and the reason he's beloved by the people who know him is I, I had something, I won't go into the full details of it, but I, I had something that I was doing connected to um the charity and foundation work um that was happening in in New Jersey. And I told him that I was going to be coming to New Jersey to do this thing. And he showed up. He's a guy who will call you, not just text you. He will show up and see you, not just email you or not just call you on the phone. And, you know, you mentioned that people you talk to have an affinity for me. I have an affinity for Fred. And for the, your guests that listen to him, they, they, you probably would know why. But he's a guy that shows up. And that's a key phrase for him. Keep showing up. And he, yeah, he does. He does in his personal, professional life. And 
Uh, I have the utmost respect for Fred. So I know you're listening, Coach Fred. So this is going this uh, shout out to you and to our buddy Dave Dick. Two amazing men. Funny how the three men, the the you and the and myself or my mothership and uh, Fred and Dave are all kind of encompassed around one company, Ameriprise Financial. Yep. Crazy. A lot of great people come out of that firm. A lot of great people. All right. So I'm going to ask the, the the probably the most profound question I think we ask on here, Brian. And you can you can uh, you can turn it down if you'd like. But um, what is the most difficult thing you've ever gone through? And what did you do when you faced that that wall? What did you do to scale it and overcome it? Yes, yeah, so I'll share. I'll share two things. They're completely uh, disconnected um, from each other, but they're they're two really two kind of profound challenges for for me in my life. So, uh, maybe I shouldn't say challenges. One, one's a difficulty; the other was a real challenge. So, um, you mentioned while you were reading my bio, you mentioned about one of the um, one of the community endeavors and foundations that I helped get off the ground. I'll, I'll just expand about on, on that a little bit because it's a it's a mission near and dear to my heart. So um, everybody listening will remember the tragic event in 2012. And we've had many, many, many others since then, unfortunately. But the, the event 2012 in, in Newtown, Connecticut, where there was the school shooting at Sandy Hook, where uh, 20 kindergartners and first graders died and, and six teachers died. And uh, uh, it, actually, you mentioned Fred's name, a mutual friend of Fred's and mine, uh, a great woman named Charlie Clayton. Um it introduced me to a story about one of the little boys. Charlie's a great financial advisor in Jacksonville, Florida. And she introduced me to a story about Chase Kowalski. It was a story, I think, you know, in the newspaper on the internet about, you know, he was one of the victims of the shooting. And the story was about his love for sport. He, he was a baseball player at six years old, um, loved basketball. And he told his parents when he was five that he wanted to do a triathlon. And Charlie sent it to me because I'm an avid triathlon. She goes, you'll love this story. It's sad as hell, but you'll love it. And so I read the story about him deciding at five years old he wanted to be a triathlete and told his parents he wanted to do a triathlon. And they found a kid's triathlon for him to do, and he entered it and he won the triathlon at six years old. And so I start, you know, perusing the Internet, reading more about him. And I, I come upon the fact that there's a GoFundMe page that, that was started, and I make a donation to the GoFundMe page. And the GoFundMe page was being managed by uh, a neighbor of the Colossians, a friend of the family. So I ended up talking to him and, and, you know, he's asking me about, you know, how I came to find out about Chase and, and why I made the donation. And I started asking him what the, you know, what the vision was for the money. Cause I, I learned pretty quickly that, you know, the family wasn't wealthy, but the family wasn't poor and they weren't going to necessarily need the money the way sometimes people truly need the money. And um, I started talking about what the vision was. And they said, look, everything that the Kowalskis want to do is to you know honor Chase's legacy and do something really positive with his life and his legacy. And so to you know, give your listeners a, a really short version of a much longer story, uh, the foundation was started with the mission of actually helping kids learn how to be triathletes. And every year, in partnership with the YMCA, a group of kids go through a triathlon training program. And at the end of the summer in Connecticut, they all complete the Chase Kowalski Triathlon. And so there's the YMCA donates time, personal trainers in the community donate time, uh, we help the kids with bicycles, running, swimming, et cetera, and they all get a chase medal at the end. And this program has expanded through multiple YMCAs, even to other states in the country. And so I was sort of there at the grassroots of it. Um, first year getting it going, I, I did a number of races and, and raised, uh, you know, raised $50,000. And then, you know, in, gosh, forgive me on the year now, we're in 2023, it was a 20, in 2018 or 2019, another school shooting happened right in my backyard. Uh, I live in South Florida. Uh, most will remember the Parkland High School shooting. Mm -hmm. And now I'm pretty deeply involved with one of the families um, um, who was impacted by that. And so you can say, what are some you know sort of challenges or, or things that are hard? You're, you're, it's interesting. You're doing this work, right? Which I'm not, I'm not on the, you know, speaking of political issues, I'm not on the anti-gun path. Like I'm not on a path to get rid of the second amendment and tell people that they can't, or shouldn't have guns. I have certain opinions about the types of guns and who can have them and what we do, which we won't get into. But the path that I'm on is trying to remember these innocent people who lived unbelievable lives, who are the victims of, of gun violence. And while you're doing that, right, you're celebrating their life and you have these events like, 
run for Beagle, Scott Beagle's the victim in Parkland, who I, I raise money for, and we do an event every year to honor through our running race. He was the cross-country coach at Parkland High School. You do these great, positive, uplifting things, um, run for Beagle and, and, and you know, the, the Chase Kowalski triathlon. And, you know, but it, it, it's so challenging because you're dealing with, you know, people and families. And as a parent of a nine and a six-year-old, I just, even though I know these people, Brian, I just, I can't imagine I literally can't imagine um, the 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 loss that that they deal with every single day, and they fight that that resiliency to honor the spirit, the memory, the legacy of their loved one. But the loss is just so profound, and so um, you know. And and maybe I'll expand on that for one more second, just to say that because this is a controversial topic guns that is in our country Mm -hmm. sometimes the loss of these actual people and human beings they get lost in the debate between should we have all guns should we take guns away should we have certain types of guns and like the the families are sometimes attacked because of the debate Mm -hmm. Um, i can tell you one of the families was contacted and said your child wasn't even real and you guys are paid actors to you know to, to prop up an argument against guns and it's like you know these families and they're dealing with this loss. So I can't overstate this enough so that it's not confusing. It's not about a debate on guns. It's like back to the divisiveness. We're one country and we have these incidents happening and innocent children, teachers, parents, brothers and sisters are dying. And we're like the smartest, richest, most powerful country in the world. And how can we rally? to figure this out and not have it be so black and white. Like it's not, you know, people say it's mental health, it's guns, it's all of it. And it's, we have a, we have a profound responsibility to figure this out together. Like we've done great things as a, as like a human race, like Like, we've cured certain cancers. We've gone to the moon. Like there's so many amazing things that we've done. This one shouldn't be beyond our reach. And um, that's definitely one of the most challenging things I, I still deal with. It's not even in the past. Um, I'll tell one other story, but maybe I'll pause for a minute to see if you have a comment well, on that or, or anything to follow up. I, you're, I think you're so right that we, I, I, number one, as you mentioned, I can't fathom that level of pain. I, I can't. I, I, and, and hopefully I never will or you never will or anybody we really know deeply will ever have to go through something like that. And we do. I mean, there's always a couple of days on the news where they talk about the victims and within 24 to 48 hours, it goes right to some, um, they, we go to the gun argument and then that gets, that's, that takes precedent. That takes the, the headline news. And then, but these victims kind of fade off into the sunset yep. and it's going back. You know, I heard a quote the other day and I'm paraphrasing. It was on the Joe Rogan show. I don't know who said it, but he said, we live in the best. This country is the greatest country in the history of the world, but man, we got to get some shit together. <laughs> and like, right. I'm like, yeah, that's called competence and pride, but humility that we're not perfect right now. We have a, we have a lot of things we need to figure out in this country. And the only way we can do that is in fact to, um, to g- come together again. And so this idea of we're trying to solve the problem, but we're going to divide ourselves is counterproductive. It, it, it's it's a dichotomy. We can't you can't do it that way to fa- solve the problem. We have to come together to solve the problem. I think John Maxwell said one is the worst number to start a movement with. <laughs> you know, you have to have a, a critical mass of people who are, you know, maybe share different political views, different cultural views, uh, lifestyle views. But yet we can come together on one thing that we want to solve this particular problem. And when you put all those divi- di- uh, diverse minds together, man, there's a lot of power in that. We could drop the echo chambers, drop the um, confirmation bias, get together, forgive one another, practice some humility, humility, some practice some gratitude, as Dr. Luskin says, and then work together to solve the problem. I think there's nothing more more powerful than that. Um, and, you, and common sense would say you would think that we have a common, uh, I don't know if common enemy is the right cause, we, we, or right phrase, we have, we have a common, common shared mission. Yeah. Children, children are dying at their school desks. I, I don't know anybody, like literally anybody who says, I'm, I'm good with that, right? Like, I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm cool with that. I'll come to, the most anti-gun, the most pro-gun. They're the most anti-mental health thinking that's an issue, the most pro-mental health. No one's okay with children dying at their school desk, right? Right. So you would think we have a rallying point to help, you know, one more family not have to deal with 
with that and if we could rally together get the best and the brightest minds the monetary resources for all the issues and solve it and so you know back to your question about challenges that's that's sort of i don't it's definitely not a professional challenge and it's not a it's not a personal challenge that i've had to go through thankfully but it, it's a mission uh close to my heart knowing knowing you know the time i've spent with with these families i'll, I'll share with your audience um just one really pretty significant personal challenge for me um you know you've mentioned several times and we've sort of woven in and out of talking about endurance sports um i took up gosh we're in 2023 probably back in 20 2009 2010 i took up uh, marathon running i started with smaller races of course but i started to venture into the marathon world and then i ventured into the triathlon world and as you read in my bio i've done several uh, several ironman events which are you know, really long distance ironman events and so um, back in in 20 uh 2021 so a year and a half ago give or take um, i was in atlantic city new jersey which as i mentioned earlier is where my, my folks live and Ironman was hosting an event there. So I signed up for that event and kind of went and did a destination race, spent some time with my family, went with one of my buddy Jeff, uh, my buddies, Jeff, up to New Jersey. And for those that aren't familiar with the, you know, the triathlon circuit, it's a, it's a three sport event. You swim, you bike, and you run. The swim is the first event. And during the swim portion of the race, there was just some un unusual things that happened with the water and the tide schedule. And, and there was some low tide it impacted our ability to swim the entire swim distance. There was a portion of the race where I actually had to stand up in the bay that we were in and we had to walk. There wasn't enough water to swim. We, we discovered that like 30 minutes into the swim. And while I was walking through this kind of muddy muck, I stepped on um, a pile of shells uh, that were all clustered together and I gashed both of my feet open. And so, you know, it's interesting, right? When you're in that world, in that arena, kind of back to the Goggins stuff, right? There's like nothing that's going to, you know, you're mentally tough, you're mentally strong, you're not going to fail. And so my, my first thought was, okay, I know I hurt my feet, but I'm in the water and I can't even really see what's going on. And so I actually finished the swim. Um, and as I finished the swim, I, I asked one of the um, lifeguards, they have many safety personnel out there. I asked one of the lifeguards to help me look at my feet. And uh, the first foot he looked at was my left foot. And he just said, he's, he's like an 18 year old surfer kid. He's like, dude, your foot is gashed. It's so bad. You know, I was like, well, that's not really the enthusiasm and the excitement that I was hoping for to see my foot be, be cut really bad. But I, I started to, you know, in that moment, mentally accept that I was going to have to drop out of the race because for the, the prior 30 minutes, although my feet were hurting, I don't think I knew the severity of the cut. And I don't think I knew, um, that I wasn't going to be able to continue. I was sort of mentally preparing for this is going to be, it's already going to be a hard day, right? You, you're doing an Ironman. It's going to be a tough day. But I was like, this is going to be a really shitty day. Pardon my French. Mm -hmm. And so um, I, I accepted that I had to drop out of the race. Um, I sought medical attention. I actually went via ambulance to the to the ER. And, and in the ER, after they washed and flushed and cleaned my feet from all the mud, um, and the punchline is I ended up needing six stitches in the bottom of both feet. So that was on a Sunday. So that obviously was, you know, lousy race outcome. I've got this injury. I've got two feet that I can't use. And I go from being an able-bodied athlete to now, you know, like crutches and walking on my heels with stitches in both feet. Well, to cut a really long story short, fast forward to the next day, I went to go see a local doctor in New Jersey. I went to see a podiatrist. And the very next day, Bri, he diagnosed my left foot as being infected. I really went to see him just to make sure that you know, I get like a good checkout from the ER that they thought that he thought the ER did a good job, that my stitches were good, that my feet would heal and I, I would be back to normal life in, in the not too distant future. And boy, am I thankful I went to see him because I was hoping he just said, yeah, your feet look good. You need several weeks for the stitches to heal and they'll be cool. He actually said, no, your, your foot's running hot and you have an infection in your foot. And you need to go right now to another doctor that I'm going to call. So I end up leaving his office on Monday afternoon. And within an hour, I'm sitting in the doctor, uh, an infectious disease doctor's office with an IV in my arm, getting, you know, pumped full of antibiotics to try to rid my foot of an infection. So they leave a pick line in my arm and I'm asked to come back the next day and the next day. And now on day four of visiting this infectious disease doctor, he determines uh, that the infection is getting worse, not better, and that we need to leave immediately and go to the ER. So I'm I'm being like rushed into the emergency room, rushed into the operating room, signing various disclosures as to what they'll need to do to essentially, and I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say to save my foot. And you know how infections go. Yeah. 
infections can spread quickly from feet to leg to body to death. And so, um, you know, it, it was quite an interesting four days from here I am in peak physical shape, getting ready to put, you know, another little notch in the race belt of, of accomplishments to, you know, being wheeled into the operating room, uh, not knowing when you wake up, you sign all these disclosures saying they can do whatever they can do. They need to do to save your life. Um, you know, take muscle, take bone, take joint, take tissue, take a foot. And, you know, thankfully it has a really, really positive outcome, right? Which is the, the surgery that they did to remove the infected tissue. It was in that moment, it was limited to just tissue in my foot. It had not spread to bones or to my other extremities. Thank God. And, you know, I had the surgery. I, you know, continued with treatment through, you know, through this infectious disease doctor. And, you know, I, I've essentially made a full recovery. I've got, a, you know, a little bit of residual stuff. It's not worth complaining about as far as there's some scar tissue and some nerve damage, but like I, I've come all the way back and done another Ironman since then. And, um, you know, but, but through that journey, right. You know, not only those four days that were really scary, but in the you know weeks thereafter, um, you know, your mental health is tested. <laughs> if you're somebody who's into physical fitness and that's immediately taken away from you, um, for those that are into physical fitness, it's not just about having a healthy body, physical fitness for me, you know, I'm a better, um, I'm a better everything when I've gotten to work at it in the day. I'm a better, you know, uh, friend. I'm a better parent. I'm a better coworker. I'm just a better everything if I've worked out. Right on. And so, you know, my mental, my mental health was tested quite a bit during that journey. And, um, you know, just, just major, major shout outs and support. Um, I, I, you know, was staying with my parents. I mean, my parents are in their seventies. They were schlepping me to the doctor. Like I was a 10 year old, you know, I was riding in the back of my mom's car. And uh, they're running me around to the doctor and to the hospital and basically taking care of me, right? So, you know, once once a parent, always a parent. Right on. Um, and, uh, and that was a pretty interesting experience. Well, I, when we talked a couple of weeks ago, Brian, you said you are you kind of are jumping into another challenge. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> you got to talk about that because uh, can you explain that to the, to the bamboo pack? Yeah. So, um, so connected to that story that I just told, well, I, it was important to me to come all the way back and do another Ironman. Like that was just a, a mental milestone that I said, okay, that this will mark my full recovery. If I can get all the way back, I've actually made a decision to do that one last race and sort of retire from, uh, from Ironman primarily because my, well, I say I've got some residual stuff left in my foot. I really can't handle the long distance running anymore, given the state of, of my foot after the surgery that I had. So you know, with, with full peace in my heart and, and happy memories and all that good stuff, I retire from the sport. But I no sooner had made the decision that I was going to retire from that than I was out for a, I was out for a bike ride with my good friend Jim Saya. And you mentioned in my bio about uh, an organization that I'm an ambassador for. It's called Special Compass. This is a really cool organization. So, so Jim is the founder of Special Compass. Um, his son uh, Michael was born with cerebral palsy. And um, Jim has just built an amazing life for his family and for Michael. They compete together in all types of endurance sports. And, and Jim, for example, Ironman, which I just talked about, Jim has completed many Ironman towing Michael. So when he does the swim, he puts a harness on and Michael's in a raft behind him while he swims. When he does the bike, there's a contraption that M Michael gets in and rides alongside a gym while Jim does 112 miles on the bike. And then when they get onto the marathon course, Jim pushes Michael in a, in a chariot the 26 miles while he's running. So whenever somebody tells me, well, you're a great athlete or you've accomplished something, I'm like, meet my friend Jim Saya, who does all the same stuff, pushing his son and pulling his son around the course. It's just insane. And so Special Compass, their whole mission, they partner able-bodied athletes, probably like you and me, with differently able people. So I show up all the time at a 5k or a 10k and Jim will give me a, a differently able person and say, Brian, you're pushing Mary today or you're pushing Joey today. And it's, it's an athlete that can't get themselves through the race and I'll show up and do a five or a 10k and push somebody. Right. And so that's the whole mission of, of special compass is helping differently able people have the same experiences athletically that able bodied people have. So I'm out for a bike ride with Jim. And he says to me, hey, if you're going to retire from Ironman, you should join my team for the crossing. It's called the crossing. And I said, I, I never heard of the crossing. What, what is it now that you want me to do, Jim? <laughs> he said, the crossing, it's an 87-mile paddleboard event where we paddle from Bimini, which is in the Bahamas, back to the coast of Florida. And at first, my brain couldn't really wrap around this, right? I said, wait a minute. That, that's got to be like 
50 miles. He goes, yeah, it's 87 miles. Uh, I said, and we're going to stand on a paddleboard across the ocean for 87 miles. And he said, that's right. And I said, that's impossible. And he goes, it's not impossible. I did it a year ago. So we finished our bike ride and I went home and bought a paddleboard. <laughs> <laughs> Had you ever been on a paddleboard up to that point? Yeah, like like once. I, I like rented a paddleboard <laughs> once before and like kind of putzed around the intracoastal waterway, you know, just, just for like scenic viewing. I had never done a, a paddleboard workout where, you know, let me get on this thing and really go to town for one or two or three hours. And so, um, you know, uh, I'm, I'm now five months into training. We're a little over two months away from the event. But sure enough, on a Wednesday in June, I'm going to get on a boat and we're going to take our paddle boards across the ocean to the Bahamas. And we're going to hang out in the Bahamas for a day or two. And then at 5 a.m. on a Friday, we're going to get on our paddle boards and we're going to cross the ocean back to Florida. Now, so the people don't think I'm really crazy. This is an organized event. Um, there's support boats and safety personnel. So, like, it's not Jim and me just deciding to navigate our way across the Atlantic. <laughs> um, we, 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 it's an organized event to raise money for cystic fibrosis. The founder of the event, his daughter, he started it as a way to raise money for cystic fibrosis because his daughter has cystic fibrosis. So... Uh, there's a big uh, there's a big charity component. I'll be doing some fundraising for it. And, uh, but yeah, nevertheless, um, I've I've been out on weekends now instead of riding my bike for four or five hours. I've I've been out on paddleboard for three, four or five hours at a time, building endurance, learning a whole new skill. Which right, we all know in life, get out of your comfort zone. Oh boy, I'm out of my comfort zone because <laughs> I'm it. not very good at it. I'm getting knocked off of it. I'm getting beat up. I'm learning. You know, it's a humbling experience to learn something new. But isn't there something beautiful, Brian, about being a novice? You know, so, especially when you know you've been in leadership so long. I've been in leadership development, peak performance for so long that sometimes it's so good to become the apprentice rather than the master. Because no question, I mean, it's, yeah, it's yeah, a yeah, you can just thing. You, right, you, yeah, it's absolutely no question. And and anytime something doesn't go wrong, you know, you're like, well, I'm, I'm learning. Or if you do something well, somebody's like, that's really good for a first timer, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of praise and. There's quick gains and, and and all that kind of stuff. So, but look, I, I think you know. Besides the fact that I personally enjoy this stuff, and, and it's also camaraderie. Right, Jim's one of my good friends. He supported me with you know fundraising I've done. I want to support him in his events. Besides all that good stuff, um, I think it just continues to set an example for my kids. I just want to keep showing them that you, you push to do new things, you push to challenge yourself. You don't back away from challenges. Um, you know, I just I want to continue to set an example for them. Well, what you're doing, Brian, is you keep showing up. <laughs> Just like Coach Fred told us, keep showing up. So I want to. We're going to include any any links because you have so many amazing causes that you're that you're you're you are uh, you know supporting and leading, or at least on the forefront of. I'd like to leave put any links we can in the show notes so people can come down, support, contribute, whatever they can do. So whatever we can put on here, I'd like to do that. I want to stop for a minute though and talk to the Bamboo Pack directly because I just want you to think about this. As I always say. Don't compare your experience with Brian, but put them together and paralyze them or not paralyze, put them together parallel and kind of follow the journey. Brian has been an endurance runner, endurance sports athlete for several, several, several years. Boston Marathon, New York City Marathon. I mean, Iron Man is a half, half, Iron Man is a half Iron Man. I mean, then he's out in New Jersey in an Iron Man. He cuts his foot on shells, dropped out of the race. Next day, he had to go to the doctor. Left foot was infected, ER, you know, and goes from this able-bodied endurance athlete to hobbling around for a while. Made a full recovery to the mo- for the most part, but his mental health was definitely challenged during this time. And he did one more Ironman. One more. He showed up one more time to Ironman and then retired from it. Now, how many people in your life, you might not be an Ironman or an endurance athlete, but your life somewhere, some way, shape, or form is has or will take a drastic turn you will find some some challenge that you stop and think holy cow it's over what am i going to do how do i get past this it could be a marriage it could be a financial issue a health issue it could be your career it could be a hobby you have a passion you have that you have to give up something's sliding doors man Paul Latham a few weeks ago on the podcast talked about sliding doors. You know, when we're, sometimes we're so focused on this one direction in life that we don't see that doors and windows around us are opening up. There are new paths, new opportunities, new challenges with, that we take our blinders off. We can see Brian never would have thought 18 months ago that he'd be doing the crossing 87 miles of paddleboard across the Atlantic Ocean. And in June, he's going to be doing that. 
we all have opportunities to either um, lament and pout and feel sorry for ourselves and give up when something's cha- when something challenges us and really stops us dead in our tracks. I mean, sometimes we have to say, yes, this part of my journey, this chapter of my book, yep, it's written. Closing the chapter. I'm starting a new chapter. That's exactly what Brian did. There's so much value and beauty in that. And I do, I do think it's because Brian has a meaningful mission in his life. He's got something. He's, you know, he's talks. He's talked so many times. Really, his entire uh, motive in life, or his mantra, is never waste the gifts. And he's not. He's using his gifts to the utmost level, and it may not be in the same arena. He's using. Uh, he does it leadership. He did it as a financial advisor. He does it as a parent. He does it. He did it in, the, in endurance sports. Uh, you know, Ironman and and. Uh, and uh, in uh, marathons, now he's doing it in paddleboard. No, he's not going to be the best out there. He might suck in two months. Who knows? But he's doing it, and he's learning a new skill set. And there's so much beauty in that because that that learning that new skill set and, and taking that new uh, avenue in life that you didn't expect because you didn't give up, you kept going in a different direction. That provides value to every aspect of your life. It's an inspiration to your family, to your friends, to your coworkers, to your employees, to the people around you. It helps your mental health, your physical health, your spiritual health, your financial health, your professional health. It's just an amazing gift to be able to continue on despite a catastrophe. So I, I think that's just an incredible learning. You're not wasting the gifts, Brian, that's for sure. So I have a question for you, Brian, and I'm going to I'm gonna preface this by, other than I know Grayson and Sterling are your biggest wins in life. The, the, obviously, that's you know, you, you, the father you are, the role model you are for them, coaching their, 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 their teams and things of that nature. But outside of Grayson and Sterling, what do you consider to be a win for you in life, a victory? That's a great question. Uh, I've heard you ask others that, and knowing we were going to talk, I, I really had to give a lot of thought to that. I, first of all, I would say that that winning for me has has evolved over my life because um, I, I love I love achievement. I love setting goals and accomplishing them. I, I I'll even admit um, I love the recognition for those things. Right? Like if somebody says "great job" or that inspired me, that that makes me feel good. Some people in the spirit of, of, I guess, attempting to seem humble. I try to remain humble, but I'll, I'll admit, I like the recognition. I, I like, you know, being told great job or that that inspired me. But for me, winning has definitely evolved. You're, you're correct. There, there's no winning quite like seeing your children um, grow and mature and accomplish something, whether, I mean, it could be something as simple as they learn to tie their shoes, or it could be as big as, you know, a couple of summers ago, uh, my oldest son, Grayson, was in his team made the basketball championship and he played lights out in the championship. We won. He was the MVP. It was like a dream, magical season. So that's an easy definition of winning and losing because it's a it's something where you keep score and there's an actual winner by definition. Right. But I like seeing them, you know, get good grades in school, make new friendships, overcome um, fears and obstacles, uh, let, letting me turn the light off to go to sleep versus having to keep the light on because they're scared of the dark, you know? Um, but, but, but in, in life outside of my kids, I definitely think the winning has evolved in terms of if, if you have a career, uh, professionally as a leader, it, it, the true essence of leadership is not about what the people on my team do for me. It becomes, what did you do for them? And so we, we mentioned somebody like Sabrina, um, uh, earlier and, and you had her on here recently. Um, I, I take more pride in seeing someone like her succeed at this juncture, knowing that she was part of my team. And I have a little slice of, of her life where I got to pour into and make an investment in her. Um, you know, by no means is anybody that ever supported her, the reason she's successful, she's a force, she's successful on her own. But, um, you know, knowing that I had, I was part of her journey and seeing her success, um, or other people who, you know, have worked, you know, with me and part of my team in the past, um, or, or people even personally, right. People have reached out to me and said, look, I, I want to run my first marathon. Do you, can you, do you have some advice for me? Somebody just that I know in my, my personal circle ran the Rhode Island marathon, uh, ran the Rhode Island marathon, um, April 15th. And it was the first time he'd ever run a marathon. And it was like, I was tracking him for the day and messaging him after and, like knowing that I gave, he had to do all the hard work, right? I didn't run a single mile for him. Um, so he gets the credit and gets the recognition, but it's a cool win for somebody to have called me at the beginning of that and said, can you give me some tips, some advice? Can we talk along the way? And then lo and behold, they, they cross the finish line for themselves. So um, I get, I get more geeked up about people crossing the proverbial finish line now and seeing them get awards and promotions and 
accomplishments than, than I do for me. As much as I'm still a recognition junkie and I love to set my own goals, uh, I think a win for me now, besides my kids, is seeing other people um, succeed off of maybe a, a piece of advice or an encouragement that I gave them. It's, it's really special. It really is, isn't it? And the, the career choice that you are in, it's such a selfless career choice. So that's why I think in coaching, leadership, you know, our goal is to help the other person succeed. So I think sometimes the recognition is how we, you know, it, and I like it too. I do like the recognition. Sometimes I don't believe the recognition uh, and I have a hard time with that at times. I have to go, eh, who, what, who are you, who are you talking about? And, but it's really does feed the soul because our, you know, our success is predicated upon somebody else's success. And that, that's not always true in a lot of careers. And I think when we, when you have that, it's so empowering to see a client or a team member or a friend or something that you've given advice to or counsel to, or you've helped to see them succeed, whether in career, sports, their marriage, their fitness, whatever it might be. There's a, such a, I don't know if it's a, you know, I don't know if it's like this, when we succeed, it's limited. If you only focus on your own success, it's very limited, but when you do help other people succeed, you can have such an exponential impact on the world. And I, I think that's so important. And I'm going to read the quote because I just, I, I, I remembered it. I pulled it up actually that John Maxwell said it was one is too small a number to achieve greatness. I, I paraphrased it earlier. One is too small of a mon- of amount to achieve greatness. And when you can help others achieve greatness, the impact you can leave on the next generation and across the world. And I mean, it's just, it's profound. It's profound. I, I have a lot of respect for people like you who have that mentality because, you know, it's interesting when I have people like you on or Sabrina or maybe, you know, probably the vast majority of my guests, if not all of them, there's almost this impression that you're super, superheroes, like you're super, like you're, oh, I can't do what Brian did. Oh, I, I could never do what Sabrina, they're a different class of people. Bullshit, man. They're ordinary people just, to, just accomplishing extraordinary things. And it all is with that mindset. And it's so amazing that my guests, so across the board, they talk about how they help other people and how they find value in helping other people. They have a purpose, a mission in life of changing other people's lives and making the world a better place. And when you do that, man, success follows. I had a guest on, I don't know, last fall, perhaps, and uh, he, he owns a, a, a fitness studio out in Portland, Oregon and an amazing man. I mean, just an incredible fighter, incredible trainer. And he said something to the effect of, and it was in a, it was in a pre-show conversation and I'm going to paraphrase him. He said, you know, Brian, I chased the dollar for many, many years. Um, and it eluded me. But once I started realizing my goal was to change a million people's lives, the dollar started ch- uh, chasing me. You know, it was like he changed his perspective on what his meaningful mission is, was not to make money. That's part of it. But the real mission is to change lives, to help others, to you know increase the sense of, self, sense of self-worth of the people around you. And when you do that quite often, the success, the fame, the money, whatever you want to call it, the accolades, they tend to now start chasing you. It has a lot to do with manifestation and energy and frequency and things of that, which Paige Elizabeth talked about on our podcast. And we've had a couple of guests talk about, about manifestation in the past. So anyway, I could go on forever on this. Oh, me too. Right. I'll I'll say one thing about that. So um, I mentioned this conference I was at last week and you brought up Bill Williams. His name is, is a guest that's been on it. He's another Ameriprise legend who's made an impact in my career. He was giving a speech last week and, and one of the quotes that he, he, or one of the things he said, maybe it's not a quote, it's something he said that I guess I'm quoting him. He said, as part of the human condition, I I wish things would be easy. And I wrote that down and I've been thinking a lot about that. He went on to say other things, right, about you know being in leadership and making choices to do things that are hard, et cetera. But that's a pretty profound thing to become really aware of. As part of the human condition, I wish things to be easy. So when you talk about people thinking that whomever is superhuman, um, nobody's superhuman, right? Everybody faces difficulty and challenge. I think one of the things, if you're an achievement oriented person and you're trying to impact other people's lives, Bill actually gave me this advice at one point and said, it's fine for you to present whatever topic you're talking about, an Ironman, a big business accomplishment, mix in how it's hard for you and why it's hard for you and why it's challenging, right? So I could have told a story about you know my injury and said, I got cut at this race. I healed and came all the way back. Right? Right. Like, <laughs> but that would have been it. I, I didn't I, even in, in telling you guys the story today, I didn't say things like, you know, I, I sat in the shower and cried. 
right? Like I, I had a moment where, you know, what am I going to do next? But too many people, the thing that maybe does make me a little different or makes other people like Goggins a little bit different is your job is to not give into wanting it to be easy, right? The human condition wants it to be easy. Your responsibility is to not give into that and swim against the current. The current is trying to take you towards the path of least resistance, right? You get in the water and just float away. It's taking you to the path of least resistance. I want to swim against the current and fight against the human condition that wants it to be easy. And so I also try to break it into small steps. Okay, I've got two injured feet, one that just had surgery. I can't go for a run and do a big workout. What can I do? You know what I can do? I can have my dad get an aluminum chair out of the garage, put it in the middle of the living room, get a set of dumbbells from Amazon, and I can lift my arms for 15 or 20 minutes and mentally tell myself I worked out today. Mm -hmm. So, Brian, I've got pictures sitting in my parents' living room, the crutches next to me, my feet in bandages, and I'm sitting on a probably a, a chair that's older than me that my parents have had since before I was born. And I'm doing bicep curls just so I can get a workout. In. And I don't say that to impress. I say that to say the human condition was just to lay in bed, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I decided not to let perfection perfection would have been going for a 10 mile run and having healthy feet. I decided not to let perfection get in the way of making progress. So for one day I made progress. I lifted biceps for 15 minutes. The next day I got on the floor and laid on my back and did some ab exercises. And just put one day in front of the next. That's all you got to do. That's all you got to do. And I think that's so powerful because I, I tell my clients a lot and I tell myself this a lot. Our brains are really designed to be lazy and scared. <laughs> they like that homeostasis. They like to, It likes to stay right where it is. It likes that comfort. And so we are programmed to do the easy things. I mean, even we were programmed to always be on alert of change or growth because we're, we're afraid of it. You know, we really are. Our primal brains are still afraid of anything that's challenging or new or even if it's a good new, we're afraid of it. And so it's a constant battle to stretch that comfort zone and go past those stages of resistance that our brain faces. There are three stages of growth and change. First one is, I call it, the, the acronym is RAID. We ridicule, we get angry, we ignore, or we deny the need to change or grow. But then when you overcome that, you get to the second stage of change, which is resistance. And that is a bear to get through, man. It's like that, you know, you have that exercise band that you're stretching. When you stretch it a little bit, you don't feel resistance. But when you have it arm length, arms length out, that resistance band, your arms are just shaking. And that thing wants to go back to its original form and its original size. And it's hard to hold it there for a while. I tell everybody, our job is mentally to hold that rubber band out as long as we can, to continue to fight through that resistance until it's stretched so much that, the re that now it's a new size. And that represents your comfort zone. And when you get to that level, you get to the third stage of change, which is acceptance. You accept the new change. You accept the growth. You accept the new version of yourself. You accept the, uh, the, the new body, the new mind, the new financial success, the new love you feel, the new relationship. And it's in that resistance, though, man. It's a tough one to get through, just like you said. I mean, we just, we don't really, we like to kind of go with the flow. It's our brains are kind of designed to kind of go with the current. And um, so I have another question. So I'm going to have you pick the time frame on this one, Brian, of your life when you were younger. And I, I'm going to come down to Florida today. I'm going to bring my time machine. We're going to jump into the thing and we're going to go back to a certain time in your life when you're going to sit down and talk with your former, former self, your younger version of who you are. And I'm going to sit back and just observe, take a few notes. What would you tell your younger version of yourself? Uh, recipes for success, uh, some, you know, uh, you know, just some wisdom to share. What would you say? Um, there's probably two time periods. One's quick and one's a little longer. I'd probably go back to when I was in high school and college and tell myself to um, study harder and work more. I'm not, I'm not uh, like a brilliant person intellectually. Like there's some people that pass exams and don't study that just sort of get by on their natural intellect. I always had to study to, to pass things and, and to, you know, get good grades or get my certifications. But I, I definitely applied myself at about like a, a 60 to 70% level in high school and college. And maybe that's normal when you're a kid. I, I wish I had studied harder and worked, worked harder and applied myself kind of the way I do in my adult life when I was when I was a kid, um, that one's quick. The, the, my early time in, in my professional life. So if I go back, right, I've been, I've been in the business world 22 years and I got involved in leadership really early and started to lead people really early. If I go back to, to you know, age 24, 25, 26, um, I wasn't as empathetic or tolerant, um, of life 
for other people than I am now because I've actually lived my own life. You know, I was an ambitious 24, 25 year old, not married at the time, not, I had no kids. I really had nothing standing in between me and just being a relentless worker. And I worked a lot of hours and I worked really hard and I, I expected people to do exactly what I did with very little empathy for a, a sick kid, an aging parent, a, a, a personal health crisis. I wasn't a complete jerk about it, but I don't think I carried anywhere near, like if you talk to people that work with me now, someone has an item, they're worried about like, you know, I'll, I'm going to, I need to take Monday off to deal with my, my, my sick dad. And I'm like, take as much time as you need and let me know what I can do to help support and make this easier for you. I, I, I didn't, say, you know, 20 years ago, I didn't say, I don't care about your sick dad. Uh, I just, I don't think I had as much empathy and as much, I didn't create as much safety for people to need to live their life and to be tolerant. And part of that may just come not only with age and maturity and me having my own family and everything else, but, you know, I've, I've also, you know, learned a lot about tolerance in life. So, you know, Judy is from Jamaica and, and she's, you know, an immigrant uh, who moved here with her dad when she was nine years old. So my kids are biracial. And so, you know, we talked about divisiveness in, in the country politically. There's also a lot of divis- you know, divisiveness um, racially, you know, and, and I've been in meetings as a white Caucasian where people don't know that, um, you know, that I have biracial kids or that Judy is black. And they've made comments that are very insensitive, thinking that they're just in the company of other white Caucasian people who would be okay with those types of comments. And so I I think the theme of all of what I'm sharing with you is just a level of tolerance and empathy. You don't know, you know, what people's life circumstances are. You don't know what they're going through. And instead of just, you know, saying that, be curious and ask questions. Like if you ask somebody how they're doing, um, actually give a shit and really be concerned with how they're doing and be willing to listen to the answer. And if you don't want to hear the answer and do something about it, don't ask the question. I love it. What you just said right there is we could tie that back to the divisiveness in our country. A little more empathy and a little more tolerance would go a long way across this country, a long way across the world, a long way than our families. You know, I think you and I share some experiences when I was a 27, 26 year old, probably 26. It was my first gig as a training manager at American Express. And I was in Troy, Michigan, I believe. And I had a, one of the people they, they gave me to, to train and, and co or manage was a gentleman by the name of Lynn. He was probably, I mean, I was 27. He was probably early, mid fifties. And he was just floundering, just floundering and floundering. And I, I was kind of, a, um, I was an idiot. I, I was an insecure, scared, overly cocky, 20, mid twenties manager who didn't have any clue what he was doing. And with my nature of being pr- fairly straightforward, I remember sitting in a meeting with him one day on a Friday and I said, okay, uh, you know, went, went through his, no, his, his, his numbers for the week. And I said, okay, Lynn, I said a couple of things we got to discuss here. Um, and I had no idea how to deliver this message, Brian. I said, um, burn those shirts because his white shirts had, had yellow and orange armpit stains. Mm. I said, burn those shirts. And if I ever see you walk in the hallway with a pack of cigarettes in your hand again, or in your back, in your front pocket, you know, and it's stain, you could see it through the label, label through the, I said, I'm going to knock them out. I said, and another thing, you have a really bad odor. I don't know what it is. And, and I said, I'm really sorry to deliver this message, but you got to figure this out. And at the time I didn't even think anything of it. I look back at horror. I'm horrified of how I, how I worded that. And he then he stopped. He goes, well, here's the deal. I don't have a lot of money right now. He was a, he was a former uh, accountant and he started this new career and, you know, at middle age and he wasn't making any money yet. And, and I said, okay, well, I said, I don't mind. And I wasn't making much money. I said, I'll lend you money to buy a couple of shirts. Um, and then he said, and I have a foot fungus, Brian. And I said, well, Lynn, go to the doctor. He goes, you guys don't let us go to the doctor here. We don't, we work from nine o'clock or eight o'clock until seven every night and five o'clock on Fridays. And then until noon on Saturdays. And I'm like, oh boy. So I said, well, why don't you do this? Take the rest of the day off, call your doctor, see if you can get in and, uh, you know, get it taken care of. Well, he did. He went to the doctor. I don't know if he went that day or, you know, anyway, but a few days later, he had his new shirts. He didn't have the odor anymore. And it was well, good. It was a, the outcome was good. He left the company a couple of years later. And I was in another office by then running the Livonia office. And he emailed me and said, or called me, whatever. And he said, hey, I want to let you know I'm leaving the company. I'm like, I'm sorry to hear that, Lynn. And he said, you know, I got to tell you, you were the only person that ever was truly, truthfully honest with me. I don't like your style. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I don't like your methods, but I want to thank you because 
you really helped me a lot. And it was because you were just so brutally honest. And I don't look back that, at that in pride. I look back that look back at that time as, you know, I didn't know any better. And to, to even think that I would speak to a person that way today, it just makes me cringe. You know, so I think I could have used a lot more tolerance and a lot more empathy back in those days as well. And I, and I think there's a lot of maturity to that. I think as we get older, we get more, we get more secure. We get, you know, more experience, more wisdom. And I think we do get softer in our hearts. I think our hearts are a little more tolerant, a little more empathetic because we've seen so many people who have suffered and we get to hear stories of their personal lives. Back then, we didn't know anything about our, our the advisor's personal lives, very little. It was all about you, you set your, you, you book your 12 appointments a week, you get a client a week, you're on the phone from nine to five, you know, two to three, and then five o'clock at, at night till eight. And that's what we cared about. And I think the world has shifted and I'm really glad it has. And I'm glad you have changed and I'm glad I have changed as well. Agreed. What's next for you, Brian? What's the next big thing for you? Besides paddling across the ocean, on a paddleboard. yeah, <laughs> that boggles my mind. I would, I'd be scared to death of sharks, man, in waves. No way. Yeah, you know, um, this this might seem counter, you know, counterintuitive, or uh, maybe just counter everything we talked about. I, I don't, I don't really have like a next big thing. I, I'm, I'm on a, I'm on a good journey at work, making an impact with people, hopefully, and uh, still trying to be a learner every day. I, I like to show up. I, I know that I do know a lot of stuff, but I, I try to walk into a room, walk into, walk into work. And I, I think that's one other big change, you know, going back to your prior question, I think I would have been uh, more curious and tried to be more of a learner than a knower. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I'm just trying to continue to make that impact uh, with work. And, you know, I'm in a busy season of my life with, uh, with the age of my kids and all that they have going on and, you know, playing sports and doing school and, you're right. I'm, I'm paddling across the country. So, uh, or across the, uh, the ocean. So, uh, so th those are, those are kind of the next, next big three for me is, you know, just continue to make sure I shape, uh, shape my kids to be good people, make an impact at work and, uh, you know, raise some money and, and get, get this paddle event done. I'm trying to keep, uh, keep things simple. So I don't, I don't have any other huge goals outside of that right now, even if that sounds counter to the achievement lines that okay. sometimes you get into a, a season of your life where you got to focus on those things and, and just do them for a while. I think it, I don't think it's counterintuitive at all. I think it's, um, you know, when I the way I look at change, growth or next steps, next goals in life, next movements, next wins, you can either start something new. You can stop something that you want to stop doing or you can continue doing something you're, you're doing now and just continue to do it better. And that's what you're doing. To me, that's the next thing is continue doing being the learner, making the impact you are in life, both personally and professionally. I think there's nothing wrong with that. I think it's a great next step. All right, Brian, as we wrap up, I have one last question. I like to call this the net question because it catches anything I might have missed in a big net. Is there any question, Brian, that I did not ask you or uh, that you wish I would have or any final message you'd like to leave with the Bamboo Pack audience? Uh, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question and then I'll answer the same question. So okay. the question you didn't ask me that I would have loved for you to ask me is if I was planning a music festival. And I could only sign two musical acts. They could be a band, a solo performer, dead or alive. Who would my two musical acts be? And so if you need a minute to think, I'll give you my answer first. Or if you're ready, you give me your answer and then I'll go. No, I would. I'll give you my I'll give you my first one. It's Johnny Cash for sure. Johnny Cash. We like it. I, <laughs> Who it, else? I, I, and not that I'm a big fan, but I think I would, I would say Elvis Presley just because he's the, I mean, Johnny, I think, is the king of country. Elvis is the king of rock. I mean, you get the two kings in a room. I think it would, I'm going to be very simplistic, maybe a little cliche, but I think that's what I, I, I like a lot of other musicians better. I just think if I was going to do a, a concert, a, a festival, I think I'd, I'd bring those two in. I think they'd rock it up. Not a bad choice. I would. I bring Michael Jackson and uh, and the Dave Matthews Band. I'm a big yeah. Dave Matthews Band fan. I've seen him over a hundred times. So those are my two uh, that I like to find out about people. Right. So your audience got to find out something new about you today. I love that. <laughs> well, you know, I I love Johnny Cash. I just do. I don't know why. I just like his I like his I like his attitude of you know dressing in black and you know when the world is a better place he'll dress in white. And I just I think he's he just had this gritty thought. You know, when you first asked that, I was thinking of my second one. I couldn't. I was thinking of Michael Jackson. Actually, cause that, that's I just like I love Michael Jackson as a performer. But another one I would even consider is Lady Gaga. Uh, listen, you play this at like a like a cocktail reception or a, at, a, at a dinner amongst friends. You realize how many great musical acts there are, and the choice becomes really hard. I mean, where do the Beatles fit in, and Led Zeppelin, and Prince, and 
you know, all the current artists too, you know, who's your favorite act now, right? All the kids like Taylor Swift. I don't know that she's a great vocalist, but she's a very popular performer. Her tickets are selling for a, a, a gazillion dollars. It gets hard really, really quick when you start listening to everybody else's musical uh, musical taste. You realize just truly how many great uh, singers, bands, you too. I mean, the list is endless, right? It's just, it's, a, it's a cool little icebreaker and something fun to learn about people. Yeah, I think, I think my daughter Ashley is actually going to see Taylor Swift sometime next fall. I've seen a bunch of girlfriends from college or, or I, a few of her friends are going to see Taylor Swift. I don't even know one Taylor Swift song. I know what she looks like because she, she's in commercials. <laughs> I don't know one Taylor Swift song. You know, I've been listening to a lot of contemporary country lately, which has never been something I've liked before. But I've been listening to a little more, more modern country lately and just listening to the lyrics and the and the, the passion and, and, and emotion behind it. And I'm like, oh, this is not bad stuff at all. So I love it, man. Good deal. Good, Good deal. deal. Well, Brian, I, I got to tell you, man, if this is officially, let me check our numbers here. I believe this is officially the longest episode I've done to date out of 85, 86 episodes. And there wasn't a second I would cut out. This was amazing, brother. I was so excited to talk to you and I'm traveling today. And here's the funny thing, Brian, this morning I got up, I did coaching calls. I went down and I rode for a while, um, did some uh, stretching and then I got showered, you know, got ready and I'm sitting there going, yep, I got everything ready. I went through your bio three times, which is standard. And I'm sitting here going, I don't even have my podcast equipment. It's still in my Jeep because I'm traveling. So I had to pull out all my, my, my call it the micro studio and I'm putting it together. And all of a sudden the, the soundproofing system collapsed it broke because it, it travels with me everywhere and it just must have been bouncing around in my jeep so I'm, I'm trying to put things together i'm like oh my gosh and i it, i thought i had an extra half an hour of just getting ready i usually meditate before the before the podcast and i'm like i gotta make sure this is super because the material and the wisdom and the experience and the stories brian's going to share this has to be i have to have my end set really well so thankfully within about 10 minutes before we, we, we you called in I got everything set up and I, I just jury rigged the the the, the, the um, studio or the soundproofing stuff just enough to get through the episode. So I think I'm going to have to be uh, repairing this or buying a new one for my Jeep. So but anyway, man, it, it was an honor. I knew you were going to be amazing and you certainly did not disappoint. You fulfilled every expectation I had of this episode and then some. So I just want to thank you. I want to thank you for being such an amazing person. Um, for the, the 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 amazing impact you make on people's lives, and it just it, this one's going to be an incredibly worthwhile. I think the Bamboo Pack's going to get a great deal of wisdom and experience and inspiration out of this, and uh, it was it was damn near perfect. I would say that. Well, thanks for having me. It's a lot of fun, and uh, you know I, I look forward to continuing to learn from all your great guests. They they pour into me and. Thanks to you for hosting these and giving back to the world, man. It's really cool. No, I appreciate that. So I have to do the official salutation. Um, and can we talk a few minutes after we, we sign off here? Yeah. Okay. So Brian Moore, my friend, welcome, or thank you for being such an amazing guest on the Bamboo Lab podcast. You got it, buddy. <laughs> All right. All right, Bamboo Pack members, please, man. I know you're going to listen to this one. If you're driving, if you're on your treadmill, walking, hiking, running, I would recommend going back home, going back to your office, being stationary, grab a pen and paper and listen to this episode again. Take notes, scrupulous notes. Please smash that like button, rate, review us, subscribe. And then most importantly, please share this with three people you love. These, this is life-changing, game-changing wisdom shared today. I think you know somebody out there who could really use parts or all of what Mr. Morris said today. So in the meantime, get out there and sculpt your life. Get out there and strive to be and give your best. So love and respect to others and to yourself. And please, by all means, live intentionally. You know how much I appreciate all of you. I thank you. Have an amazing week. We'll talk to you in a few days.